Welcome to another EduMed video and in this video we will be talking about the intensive care ward and specifically focusing on the airway. What I'll be advocating throughout this series is the ABCDE approach to assessing the patient for the intensive care ward round and it's worth watching the first video, part one of this series, to just get an introduction into that. In terms of the airways, Patients can either be spontaneously breathing and therefore not have any kind of um, device in the airway, or they can have an oral endotracheal tube, which you can see here on the left-hand side, or a tracheostomy, of which you can see one form here on the right-hand side. With every endotracheal tube, whether that goes through the mouth or a tracheostomy, the first thing that you must always make sure with every patient is that is the, patient, is the um, tube in the right place. Generally speaking, it can be in one of two places. If it's the or oral tracheal tube, then it could either be sitting in the trachea or it could be sitting in the mouth or in the esophagus, i.e. it accidentally coming out. With a tracheostomy, it can either be sitting in the trachea or it could have dislodged and be sitting in the soft tissues of the uh, neck. This is important because patients can very rapidly deteriorate and become hypoxic and potentially have a cardiac arrest. So always knowing that it's in the right position is vital. How do we do that? Well, it's really important to watch my first videos on the oral endotracheal tube and the tracheostomy, which goes into this in a lot more detail. But essentially, you should always have the end tidal CO2 trace up. You can see this in the picture here, where if you look, you can see that there's a graph just here where you can see little spikes going up. And that is the CO2 being monitored by the machine, the ventilator, or in this case, the monitor. If you can't see that trace with each breath, then the tube is in the incorrect position. And therefore, you need to reassess that patient and potentially replace that tube or do something slightly different depending upon the situation that you're in, but certainly call for help. So always look at the end tidal trace. All that will tell you is that the tube is in the trachea. What you then need to see is, is it in the right place in the trachea? And that is where examining the patient comes in really helpfully. You should listen to the patient's chest. You can see here, listening to the left side, listening to the right side. The risk is that the tube can go in too far and then, generally speaking, it goes into the right main bronchus. So you have reduced air entry in the left side. If you ever hear that, you must always think to yourself, has the tube gone in too far? How do you assess that? One thing you can do is look at the numbers that are on the endotracheal tube and see what number it's at at the lips. If it's been documented to be at, say, 22 centimetres of the lips, but when you go to examine the patient, the tube is actually at 30 centimetres to the lips or 28 centimetres to the lips. Then you need to think to yourself, has it moved in too far when the nurses were rolling the patient or if there was some sort of knock on the tube and it pushed down? Be careful because that doesn't necessarily correspond to the tube having moved down. As these endotracheal tubes get warm, they become more flexible so they can curl in the back of the mouth. So it's an indicator but it's not definitive. The definitive way to see where the end of the endotracheal tube is is by doing a chest x-ray and the chest x-ray has a number of benefits. You can see here on the left hand side this is where the endotracheal tube is sitting in between the clavicular heads and above the level of the carina. So you can see there there's between one and three centimeters between the two and that is adequate. This endotracheal tube, you can see has gone in a bit further. So if this is the carina there, you can see that it's sitting down, but it's sitting a little bit closer. The, but it's probably okay. But can you see here that there's a pneumothorax? So with positive pressure ventilation, another reason for a patient having reduced air entry could be that they've developed a pneumothorax. And they're at high risk of that, especially if they're on very high pressures, if they've got significant ventilatory failure. So the differential um, auscultation that you can have here could be due to that. So that's another great thing that the um, x-ray can show. 
The x-ray here on the right hand side, you can see that the endotracheal tube has gone way too far in and it's sitting in the right main bronchus and it's collapsed down the right upper lobe and the whole of the left side. And if you leave it like that, then the patients will become significantly hypoxic over time. So that tube needs to be pulled back out. The other things that can cause differential um, lung expansion is things like pneumonias, which are very common in patients with um, mechanical ventilation. So a chest x-ray really is vital in these patients. When you're doing the daily assessment of the airway and you've got an endotracheal tube, the first question you need to ask yourself is, do they still need it? Often these patients get better and better over time and so you need to think a little bit about when can you extubate them. I won't go through that in too much detail here, but it's worth asking yourself that. The level at the lips or the teeth, this is looking at the number, so you can see the number here, 22, 24, 28, 26, and so on. You see what level it's at. I, as I said before, just because the number has got greater, so maybe it's at 26, doesn't necessarily mean that the tube has moved in. It might be just that it's curling in the back of the mouth but it's always worth assessing each patient and making sure that it's in the appropriate place. If you have any doubts, as long as you've got a good end tidal CO2 trace, you've got time to go and have a look at an x-ray, repeat the chest x-ray and make sure that nothing has happened. You'll be surprised how often those tubes move in and out when nurses are rolling the patient, moving them, taking them off bedpans and so on. The final thing that's worth looking at every single day is the cuff pressure. The nurses will often document that or they'll have an automated system of constantly measuring the cuff pressure. Again, I'd really highly recommend you go through my videos on the endotracheal tube and the tracheostomy, which we go into a lot more detail about what the significance of that is. Again, with both of those videos, they'll go through how to troubleshoot an endotracheal tube. Whenever you're assessing um, the airway of a patient during the ward round, you need to see whether there is a cuff leak, whether the patients suddenly have high airway pressures, if the tube has actually dislodged itself, or if the patient is intolerant of the tube, if they're not breathing properly on it or biting down on the endotracheal tube. All of those things are covered in a lot more detail in my um, lectures on the endotracheal tube and the tracheostomy, so I'll refer you to those rather than going through them again here. You also need to ask yourself, can this patient be extubated? And in order to answer that question, you need to think about a few different things. And these are the four main things that I think about when I'm asking myself, can I take this endotracheal tube out? The first thing is secretion loads. If the nurses say, oh, every five minutes I'm just sucking up loads of thick and purulent sputum and it's really difficult to get it all out. At this point, with the endotracheal tube in, you've got a conduit that allows you to remove that sputum. It allows the chest physios to get it all out. So if you've got lots and lots of secretions, there's a chance that the patient may start to accumulate them. And if they accumulate them, they can end up worsening their pneumonia, collapsing down lobes, or even producing a nice environment for new infections to occur. So if the secretion load is high, be very careful about extubating those patients. I wouldn't say it's a hard and fast rule because sometimes patients with a lot of secretions, we do still extubate them. And that comes down to the next point. They should have a good cough. Always ask the nurses, what happens when you put the suction catheter down the endotracheal tube? If they have a really good cough, then there's a good chance that the patients will cough out the secretions that are in the lungs and therefore be able to continue on and to be able to take part in chest physiotherapy for once that tube has come out. There are a variety of different ways and extubation checks that physiotherapists do. They measure things like negative inspiratory forces, i.e. how strong the muscles are creating a negative pressure inside the chest, and then the positive expiratory pressure of when they um, cough it out. Now, we'll go through that in a lot more detail in future videos, but it's always worth just asking what the cough is like, just to get an idea. The level of delirium is really important. A lot of patients get delirium in intensive care and it shouldn't necessarily stop you from 
extubating a patient, but what you must make sure is that the patient is able to follow commands. Because if they can't, if once you've extubated them, they're not coughing well or they start to retain secretions, the only thing that you can do before having to reintubate them is allow them to cough the secretions out or take part in chest physio. If they're delirious, if they're agitated, if they're not following commands, then it's worth not extubating them until you've got that delirium under control. Similarly, some people can become hyperactive with their delirium, and once the sedation is stopped for the tube tolerance, they become unmanageable and become unsafe both for themselves as the patient, but also for the nurses and the other staff. So you always look at the level of delirium and manage it appropriately. And finally, you need to see whether they still need the ventilatory support. And the best way that we have of seeing that is by, first of all, looking at the amount of oxygen that they're on. If they're on 50, 60, 70 percent of oxygen, there's no point in taking that endotracheal tube out until you've got the lungs a bit better. However, if they're on 25, 30 percent oxygen, that's a much more reasonable amount that you'd be able to provide through supplemental um, oxygen, either through high flow nasal oxygen or with a face mask. You can also do something called a spontaneous breathing trial. Look at my videos on CPAP pressure control to know how the ventilator actually augments breaths and supports the patient when they're still on a ventilator but spontaneously breathing. What you want to try and do is to get rid of all that support and see how they are breathing for themselves. And so the way we do that is we stop the pressure support or reduce it down to a very low level. Some people talk about using five of CPAP and five of pressure support. And then you see how the patient breathes for themselves. And if they start to become very tachypneic, if their breathing becomes very fast, or if they look agitated, sweaty, then it's probably worth not taking that tube out. And we'll go through that in a lot more detail in later videos. The way in which I do my spontaneous breathing trials might be slightly different to other people but what I tend to do is not to switch off the PEEP. I leave a certain amount of positive end expiratory pressure and part of the reason for that is there's a lot of intrinsic resistance in the system. If you imagine breathing through a straw that's exactly what these patients are doing with an endotracheal tube and so you need to try and give them a little bit of support because it's always harder to breathe through a straw than once you take that tube out and they breathe th through their trachea as per normal. There is a mode called automatic tube compensation that is on most uh, new ventilators. What this does is you can dial in the size of the endotracheal tube that you have and then it gives a little bit of support so as to overcome the resistances in the tube. Because otherwise you can imagine if you've got a huge tube a large straw and you try to breathe through that, it's easy. Whereas if you've got a tiny little pencil sized straw, it becomes really difficult to breathe through it. So the ventilator can do some clever things with the pressure to try and overcome some of that resistance. So if you've got it, use it. A common mistake that I see in patients who are put on spontaneous breathing trials is that they're left on it for days or even hours and hours. The problem with doing this is that if you try breathing through a straw, for say five hours or six hours you will become tired so if you've tired the patient out and then at the end of the day decided oh they've managed to breathe through that all take the tube out now they're having to breathe for themselves there's not the support of the machine and you've spent four to six hours of them being tired so i generally tend to use a sprint of about two hours but different people will do different things look at your institutions um, policy. Now when you're doing a spontaneous breathing trial it's important to put some parameters in place because there are certain things that show that the patient is not ready to be weaned and so there's no point in continuing on with the spontaneous breathing trial. The sort of parameters that's worth thinking about is one is the respiratory rate. If you've got someone who's very tachypneic, respiratory rate above 30, that's not sustainable over a period of time. So even if you took that tube out, if they started breathing at 30, yes, they may be able to do that for a day or two, but soon they'll tire out. So if you've got a respiratory rate of less than 30 breaths per minute, you're probably doing okay. 
If you find the patient's becoming really hypertensive once, or they're very tachycardic when they're put on the spontaneous breathing trial, again, it shows a level of physiological strain for that patient, and that may not be sustainable over a long period of time, and may indicate that the patient's not quite ready to be extubated, even if the respiratory parameters stay normal. And then the most important thing, as with all things in intensive care, is that end of the bed test. If you look from the end of the bed and the patient looks like they're struggling, they're sweaty, they're using accessory muscles, they don't look comfortable when they're on the spontaneous breathing trial, it's probably an indicator, even if the physiological parameters that you see on the monitor are normal, it shows that the patient is struggling. And yes, they may be okay for a day or even two days, but eventually they will tire themselves out because no one can maintain that level of adrenergic drive for prolonged periods of time. If they do have an oral endotracheal tube in, the thing that you need to also ask yourself is, do they need a tracheostomy? Now, why put a tracheostomy in at all? Well, again, please go to my um, video on tracheostomies where we go through this in a lot more detail. But essentially what it is, is that you can reduce down the amount of sedation that the patient needs because the tube is not going through the vocal cords and therefore not stimulating that gag and cough reflex. And, but other, instead, it's going through the neck and straight into the trachea. So patients can come off their sedation and if they're not delirious, it's fantastic because it's much less drugs that they're on and therefore much less chance of them becoming delirious over time. They can also interact with their nurses and with the family. Also, if patients you think are going to be ventilated for long, long periods of time. By putting in a tracheostomy, you can reduce the amount of dead space, the amount of resistance, and therefore you can start weaning down the ventilatory support a lot, little bit more easily than with long endotracheal tubes. The patients for whom tracheostomies might be helpful are those who develop significant muscle weakness, who aren't able to give the good coughs, or they have a lot of secretions that aren't getting better. And for those, you might need a permanent airway in just to help with the suction. With agitation, it might also be helpful as well because having a tube in the mouth sitting between the vocal cords can be very stimulating and therefore worsen delirium over time. Also think about the underlying pathology. Of course, a patient with just a simple lobe of pneumonia that gets better probably won't need a tracheostomy. However, a patient who's got significant underlying lung disease with bullous emphysema or lung fibrosis who um, then develops an autoimmune condition or significant bilateral pneumonia that creates further fibrosis. These patients will often end up needing intensive care with ventilation for longer periods of time and so for those people putting in a tracheostomy is helpful. In later talks, I'll be going through this in a bit more detail, but essentially most of the data that we see so far, the biggest um, RCT to date being TrackMan, has essentially shown that there's no real difference between doing an early tracheostomy and a late tracheostomy in terms of days on ventilator and outcome. And so therefore, whenever you, the team, the patient and their family feel that it's appropriate, it's probably right. You're not going to run into risks of delaying it for a couple of days to make sure it's the right decision. If they have a tracheostomy in place, you need to ask yourself a couple of questions. Again, I'd really highly recommend you watch the video on tracheostomies to get a little bit more understanding of what these things mean. But essentially, you want to see whether you can give them periods of cuff down you need to be careful if they've got lots of secretions by bringing that cuff down you can cause an increased risk of aspiration so often people do sprints of cuff down monitor secretion levels you could try periods without being on the ventilator at all and just putting a humidifier on the vent on the tracheostomy something like a swedish nose and by doing so giving them periods to build up their um, respiratory muscles again by having the cuff up, you can also push on the um, esophagus, therefore making it difficult for the patient to swallow orally. And also, you not, might not be sure about whether the patient's silently aspirating if their cough reflex has been obtunded through chronic illness and weakness. So you can do things like blue dye tests. They're not done very often nowadays, but what you do is basically put a drop of blue food dye on the back of the tongue, 
And then as you suction the um, tracheostomy over the course of a few hours, you watch and wait to see whether there's any blue dye that stains the secretions. If there is blue dye that stains the secretions, it tends to indicate that you're getting silent aspiration of secretions from the mouth into the um, trachea. And if that is the case, they're at risk of developing aspiration pneumonias. And so having the cuff up is probably safer for them. One of the reasons for having the cuff down periods is that by being able to accelerate the cuff down, you can then put a speaking valve on and that allows the patient to have some voice and be able to communicate a lot easier, which can certainly help with delirium and also their mental state. And in order to try and uh, maximise the ability to be able to re breathe around a tracheostomy, you may think about doing things like downsizing tracheostomies. These are often MDT decisions made through discussion with the nurse at the bedside, the doctors, the intensive care doctors, the patient, the family, the physiotherapists, and also the speech and language therapists. So it's a big decision to have a tracheostomy, and then once you've had it, how you manage the weaning of that tracheostomy. So in summary, when you've got a patient with an endotracheal tube, your first question should always be, is it in the right place? And then do they need it? And if they do need it, are they safe for extubation? If they don't need it, are they safe for extubation? With a tracheostomy, you need to think a little bit more about how you do a stepwise wean off the tracheostomy. And finally, do they need it long term? And if they do, thinking about why they need it, if it's for secretion management, and if there's other ways in which you can do that. But it's really a multidisciplinary team decision and it's always worth involving the chest physios, the nursing staff at the bedside and the speech and language therapists who are all fantastic and able to give you advice on what the best thing to do is.